Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius. Welcome back to the podcast. And this podcast is going to be about loss of confidence and shame. Loss of confidence and shame. Two things that are truly fatal to a person, especially to a man, and to a civilization, and to a nation. So we're going to talk about what I mean by loss of confidence and shame. And we're going to probe into the reasons why these two things are so fatal and so detrimental to the health of an individual or to a nation. So let's let's talk about that. You know, I put out a tweet a few days ago, and the tweet said, and I'm not going to go back and read the exact tweet, but it said something to the effect that there are two things that are utterly fatal to both an individual and to a civilization, and that is loss of confidence and shame. And there were some respondents to this tweet, and they asked me to go into a little bit more detail about this subject and what I meant by that, so I decided to do that, decided to do that. And that's why we're here now. And this is what I meant by loss of confidence. Let, let's let's first look at the first condition that I that I talked about, loss of confidence. Well, first I think we need to establish that the maintenance and the existence of a healthy sense of confidence is absolutely critical in the functioning of every person's life. In the functioning of every person's life. You have to have a sense of confidence. That sense of confidence is what gives you the sense of mission. It's what gives you this inner conviction. It's what gives you this sense of purpose in life. The ability to overcome obstacles, the knowledge that you will be able to overcome obstacles, and in many ways, the knowledge that you are better than the next person. This is a good thing. A sense of confidence is something which... Um, is behind the upward progress of all individuals, I would say. Because if you don't have a sense of faith in yourself, okay, and that word confidence, we, we see the Latin word fides, uh, you know, faith, the, this, this, this idea of, of faithfulness, of, of, um, of conviction in an action. Without this sense no one is going to be able to do anything. And I think also nations and societies need a a sense of confidence in order for them to reach their golden age, to progress through their silver and golden ages, and to achieve great things in their histories. They need to have a sense that they are imbued with a certain sense of purpose and a mission, and that in many ways they are they're separate and distinct and special. You have to have that. Now, I'm not going to get into whether that is a, uh, you know, what the effects are of that because it's, it's a Janus-faced thing. There's both good and bad things that come out of that. But no one who looks at the span of human history can deny that a sense of confidence is an absolutely critical element in the progress and the development of empires. If we just look at the, for example, the British Empire, here you had, think about this, here you had a very small, a relative, well, not not relatively, but a very small island control for several hundred years, vast portions of the globe. And they did not do this with the garrisoning of large numbers of troops. They did it really through this perception that they were better, that they were superior, that they had something special. And and this is not just me saying this. If you look at the historians, uh, those writers who have written about the history of the British Empire, they will all freely admit that in many ways the British Empire's maintenance relied on perception. It was a perception, a perception that there was this all-encompassing power out there. How else can you explain that a nation the size of India would be controlled by a very, very tiny handful of individuals. How else could you explain that a a nation the size of uh, England could control uh, essentially all of the North American continent, both Canada and America, for such a long period of time? 
It's all about perception. It was all about perception. Now, eventually, that perception was shattered. Eventually, that perception was shattered. If you look at the effect of the First World War and then the Second World War, all of that perception was, was gone, was destroyed forever. And once it's gone, it's gone. The enemies of, uh, of England in the First and Second World Wars, uh, Japan and Germany, and to a lesser extent, uh, Turkey, were able to demonstrate to the world that the British Empire really was not as all-powerful as it appeared to be. And again, once that loss, once, once that perception was broken, once that, 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 that intangible perception of power was broken, it was difficult, if not impossible, to recover that. And all of England lost all of her colonies and all of her empire, essentially, in a blinding spe with a blinding sense of speed. It happened. Now, my point here, I'm, I'm just using this as an example. I'm not here to get into a big historical discussion of empires because we can use the same analogies, I think, with the Ottoman Empire, with other empires in history, Rome as well, the perception of power. Once that's gone, it's gone. Uh, this is how things are. You know, this is the point that I'm making, a sense of confidence. And I think we can say the same thing with individuals. If, a, if an individual does not believe in himself or herself, if an individual is not able to have that inner sense of conviction, they're not going to be able to do anything. They're not going to be able to get up out of their chair. And so this is why you need to protect, cultivate, and develop your sense of confidence and put more attention into this than almost anything else I would submit. Because much of success in life, much of survival in life, depends on a state of mind. Depends on a state of mind. Look at the movie The Edge. There was a movie that came out in the late 90s, 1997, called The Edge. It starred Anthony Hopkins, Alec Baldwin. Very, very good movie. But there are some good scenes in there where, uh, where uh, Anthony Hopkins makes... Uh, the, the, the theme of the movie is that there is a, a party of men stranded in the wilderness, and they have to try to make their way out. And they are stalked by a bear, a large, I assume it's a grizzly bear, maybe a black bear or a Kodiak bear. I don't know what the hell kind of bear it is, but in any case, they're stalked by a bear. And Anthony Hopkins makes the point of trying to buoy the spirits of Alec Baldwin, who is sinking into despair. And he tells him, he tells Alec Baldwin that what one man can do, another can do. And he tells him, we can kill this bear. We can do this. We can do it. We have to have a plan. We have to have organization. We have to have a mission. And we have to put it into uh, execution. We have to put it into effect. What one man can do, another can do. And initially, Alec Baldwin is skeptical. He doesn't believe it. But after a steady stream of convincing, after a steady stream of berating from Anthony Hopkins, he begins to believe it. And this is so important. This is so important because you have to believe that you can win. You have to believe that you can do it. You have to have that sense of confidence. You have to have it. Go watch the movie and you'll see what I mean. But in any case, my point here is that anyone or anything that tries to undermine your sense of confidence is your enemy, is your mortal enemy. He or she is, is as much of an enemy as someone who tries to strip away your defenses when you are faced with external attack. Losing your confidence is fatal. And so anyone who tries to undermine your sense of confidence, who tries to belittle you, to denigrate you, to make you feel bad, to make you feel guilty, to do anything to undermine that is your enemy. And you need to understand that. You need to take that to heart in the most serious way possible. You need to remember that because confidence is your oxygen. Confidence is your oxygen. It is your breathing tube when you are underwater. And if you don't have a belief in yourself, let me tell you, you're screwed. You're screwed. And your enemies 
who operate these days on more of a psychological basis and in a psychological arena than in a physical arena. In the old days, your enemy came at you with a spear or an arrow or a knife. It was different. Nowadays, what they do is they try to whittle away, they, tr they try to chip away at you with lies, with confusion, with poisons, uh, mental and physical. And they try to wear you down psychologically by crippling your sense of confidence. Okay, the media, other people, okay, all of these people who do this to you are, are enemies and they need to be seen as such. And you need to either avoid them and not be around them, not expose yourself to them, or you need to um, let them know in no uncertain terms that you are not going to accept someone trying to undermine your sense of confidence. Now, of course, and it should go without saying, that a sense of confidence is not the same thing as arrogance, blinding stupidity, uh, meatheadism. Uh, you know, there's a big difference. So don't confuse confidence with chest-beating arrogance. That's a huge mistake a lot of people make, and that's not what I mean. Okay, I'm not going to define... Uh, you know, go into detail about, you can look up confidence, you can look up what that means, but there's a difference between confidence and being a, an arrogant dork. That's the difference. So know the difference. In any case, that's the first thing. Loss, a loss of a sense of confidence is, uh, is very, very harmful to an individual or to a country. And when a country loses its sense of confidence as well, it becomes subject to attack. When a country, when a nation... Uh, loses that sense of specialness when it be begins to see itself as a oh in a very negative or neutral light then it's it's in big trouble it's in big trouble because how else can you bind together a social organization a group of, of individuals other than with a shared sense of mission and once that shared sense of mission goes away what you have is a collection of individuals. What you have is a collection of self-seeking, self-gratifying individuals. And you don't have a society. And this is one of the big problems that we're facing now. All right, so enough of confidence. Let's, let's move on to shame. What do I mean by shame? Well, I took, the, I took the opportunity, before we start talking about shame, to look up to actually get the Oxford English Dictionary, which I have, it's the entire 13-volume set from the 70s. It's a very, 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 very good resource. And I'm going to read for you, I'm going to read for you what, the, what the word shame means. So there's, there's no confusion about what that means. Shame is this. Shame is, okay, it says, the painful emotion arising from the consciousness of something dishonoring, ridiculous, or indecorous in one's own conduct or circumstances or in those of others, whose honor or disgrace one regards as one's own, or of being in a situation which offends one's sense of modesty or decency. Okay, now we're not talking, we're not talking here about shame in the sense of a modesty or indecency. We're talking about something, a sense of shame, a sense of guilt really is what it comes down to, a sense of guilt over having done something wrong, allegedly having done something wrong. And shame can arise in many different ways. Shame can be the result of, of defeats, you know, a succession of defeats, a loss of power, a loss of control, a it's some so, some form of humiliation. Shame is triggered by some form of humiliation. And I really started to see just how terrible shame can be as a as a as a uh, a permeating consciousness in a people. When years ago I studied, I, I happened to have the opportunity, and I won't go into really the details of all this, but I, I, I took it upon myself to study the, um, the sort of the, the anatomy of language death, this phenomena of language death, how languages die, how minority languages are gradually uh, extinguished or uh, just just uh, uh, are just fritter away and and just are no longer used. And 
I specifically focused on the British Isles, and I was looking at the phenomena of, of the Celtic languages and their decline in the British Isles, specifically the Irish language, uh, Scots Gaelic, uh, or Erse, uh, Welsh, Manx, Cornish, and also in France, um, the um, uh, Breton, the Breton language in, in Brittany. These are all Celtic languages, okay? And I wanted to, to, to see how or why, how is it that these languages became marginalized in favor of English and faced, uh, in some cases, extinction and in all cases, uh, you know, successive marginalization? Well, there were a lot of factors. Obviously, the, the growth, the, the political power of England, the growth of English political power, the, uh, just the military and, and political and economic power of England, gradually just kind of brought the surrounding peoples within its orbit. This Part of this is just the natural gravitation of power. But what was really interesting to me what was one of the factors was the people speaking these languages, Scots Gaelic, Irish, Welsh, Breton, um, Cornish, Manx, the people speaking these languages became, in many ways, they just stopped speaking it. They were animated by and they were consumed by a sense of shame. They, they felt that their languages, that their cultures were linked to backwardness, to retrograde thinking, they felt that their languages had not um, had not measured up to the requirements of the modern world. They they had they voluntarily gave it up. They felt that hey, if we want to get along in the world, we have to get rid of the old ways, allegedly the old ways, and adopt the new ways, which meant English. And you know, of course, you know this is all nonsense. Because any language, I would submit, can be adapted to the requirements of the modern world. There's, no, there's nothing inherently, one of, my, one of my theories of language is that no language is inherently superior or, or inferior, inferior to any other language. It's simply a, a matter of what people choose to employ as their tool. In other words, if there had been a determined, a determined program to revive these endangered languages. It could have succeeded if the people wanted to do it. If the people wanted to prevent these languages from going extinct, they could have done it. But in some cases, they didn't, they, they didn't do it. And one of the major motivating factors behind that language extinction was shame, I would submit. And I've, again, I've studied this phenomena. And you, do, you see, I'm again, it's not just in the British Isles, you see it also around the world. In other, in many other cultures and countries where you have small minority languages that are under attack by majority languages. And this is the, this phenomenon of language death and language extinction is it's complicated. I'm not saying it's the, shame is the only factor, but it's one of the factors. It's one of the factors. The people themselves have to want to revive it. The people themselves have to want to retain a connection to their culture, to their to their uh, to their heritage. And when they don't do that through a combination of shame, shame at being defeated, shame at being marginalized, shame at being um, subjected to the to the power and the dominance of another tribe. This is what it comes down to. When you're a conquered people, when you're a conquered people, you lose something. You lose your sense of confidence. You graft onto your consciousness a sense of shame. I would submit. I would submit. And you lose your you, you lose yourself. You really lose yourself. And it's very um uh, it's it's very very in some ways it's very tragic because when you voluntarily give up your language your culture you are giving up that very thing which gives you your identity and you should never ever give that up never ever it's more important than anything else the language is the most important thing uh, i would submit than anything else and all it takes is is a determined effort 
The people have to want it. The people have to believe it. The speakers have to want to do it. You can't save a language that's endangered or threatened unless the people themselves want to do it. And it can be done if the will is there. If the will is there and the dedication is there, it can be done. Any language can be modified to meet the requirements of the modern world. All you have to do is invent new words. It's very simple. It's not a big deal. It's not a, it's not a major problem. Okay, But there needs to be the will to do that. And when you, when you have a people that's been beaten down, they've been crushed maybe militarily, maybe economically, whatever, whatever what have you, there's going to be a sense of shame there, and there's going to be a sense of loss of confidence. So my point here is that shame is a terrible, terrible thing to acquire and to retain. Never, never, never allow yourself to be consumed with shame. No matter what you've done, forgive yourself. Even if you haven't, uh, even if you have done something terrible, you should try to forgive yourself to let go of this feeling of shame because if you don't let it go, it's going to cripple you. And a corollary to this is that you should never allow anyone to try to inflict a sense of shame on you for things that you have never done. Never allow anyone to graft onto you, to project onto you a sense of unmerited shame. Even if it is merited, let's say even if it is merited, so what? So what? You know, so what? You can always recover from anything. It's never too late to recover from anything, but I just see so many guys and girls uh, these days walking around with their heads hanging low, dragging their asses, uh, consumed with this sense of guilt, of shame over things they never did because they're brainwashed into thinking that they should have this sense of shame. And this is very, this is fatal. This is how you lose yourself. This is really how you lose yourself. So the first step is being aware of these things. The first step is being aware of it. The second step is letting go of it. And you've got to let go. You've got to let go. You've got to make an internal mental decision to not be uh, brainwashed, really, to not be uh, subjected to this type of, uh, of, of berating, okay? Because it is fatal. It's fatal. So anyway, though that will conclude my remarks here on um, confidence and shame. And please uh, listen to what I'm saying here and realize that this is something you can apply in your everyday life in almost anything you do. All right. That'll be all for tonight. I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night. <laughs>